Now, did, did all of this occur before you wrote Alabaster Box, or what, what year did you write that? I wrote Alabaster Box in 1990, actually. Okay. Um, at right, it, it was 90, 90 or 91, and it was during the time when the Clintons were in our life. And uh, I actually... Um, he has a wonderful and lovely, very talented friend who was a, a high school friend. And he's, he was very loyal to his circle of friends that were with him in Hot Springs. And she is the one who heard me sing for Ray Charles. And she is the one who said, if you want to get someone, you know, from the Pentecostal movement to sing these songs for your inauguration. You need to get this girl rather than bring someone from outside. Well, that was a God mm. thing because there are, I have always felt humbled. I felt like that I am the least as far as I think there's so many singers and musicians, 10,000 times better than I am. It's just that the Lord kept opening doors for me and mm. I did not seek it. I, I, it just opened. And so she was the one who called up and said, would you, you know, Governor Clinton, and he had actually met us before. This is what's funny. When he was the attorney general, he had come to Lone Oak and we, we actually met them uh, before he was ever governor. So, you know, God, when you, you, you have to live long enough to see how God has ordered your steps you need to live long enough and go through enough that you turn around and go, wow, mm, I see how so it true. all fits. It yeah. looked random, wasn't random at all. Mm. I was moving somewhere all this time and it was powerful. And, and the alabaster box came about because my father-in-law went back to St. Paul to preach um, he was receiving his four-year degree. And um, Brother Norris, who was still alive at that time, invited him to speak on a Sunday morning. And they had a very lengthy song service. And he wanted me to either sing before him or after. And and I said, well, you know, I, I think people are sung out right now. I think maybe just you need to preach and then I'll I'll follow you up. I'll do I'll do your altar call. And never knowing, I mean, I listened, um, I listened to him preach about the woman with the alabaster box. He, he actually spoke on the three instances where women, whether the same, two different, uh, I, I, you know, there's debate, scholarly debate. The point was that she was unashamed to make herself vulnerable in the presence of people who were not feeling what she was feeling who had absolutely no compunction to be so demonstrative. That got me immediately because I felt an affinity with that testimony because I always felt like I had more to give than was necessarily, um, what do I want to say? I guess when you're desperate for God and you want God just going through the motions just is not acceptable. Mm. I was just so hungry. And so my worship tended to be demonstrative before that was accepted. Let me say it like that. Because I needed God so desperately. And so when I saw how she was rejected, because, you know, the same people can sit on the same pew. One of them is absolutely um, hanging on to every word, every word. And the other is like, when's it going to be over? You know, yeah. you, you bring, points. you bring your context to the service. Mm. And so I identified with her and as he began to, I was so moved. I was like, this is me. And I was so utterly moved by what he was preaching. And I was thinking, flipping through uh, the Rolodex of my mind, what song will bring this home? Because so many songs can destroy a sermon. 
<laughs> it makes or break it. It breaks it, whatever you choose. So I was like, oh, Lord. And I was like, I have nothing. So I just got a piece of paper. Seems like it was a tithing envelope. I opened it up and I just started writing in pencil. And then I got up and went to the piano and I just made up the melody wow. on the fly right there. Mm -hmm. Cause it was so, I was so moved. And um, that was the first time I sang it. And then I went home and I think I tightened up some of the lyrics and I formed up the melody line. And I was teaching a Bible study to the president's friend at that time when he was governor and I sang it for her. And um, during the Bible study, not that particular time, but for the time that we studied together and I talked to her about that, she got the Holy Ghost at her house. And, and then our paths diverged and she went on her way and she was raised Southern Baptist. Um, and um, I, th I, I, I was trying to remember if her father was a Southern Baptist pastor, but um, she sang as a, cantor in a Jewish synagogue and she was so talented and so um, but I you know our paths crossed the Lord filled her with the Holy Ghost and then she went and and went to seminary uh, and became licensed as a United Methodist minister but she got the Holy Ghost mm. I was there when she got it and um, I, I again the worship has always been the center I love you, Jesus. I want to know you. Mm. Use me how you want. And and since I was a child, he has occupied my thoughts. Probably not even a drop in the bucket to the extent to which I've occupied his and everyone who's curious about him. I have never lost my desire to know more of him. That has informed basically everything I've ever done. Yeah. It's liberating because I didn't have to prove anything to anybody. At the mm. end of the day, no matter what happened, I was still going to go home with the one who brought me.